Hey Akiks, welcome to another video. So today we will be discussing many scientific phenomena that you will definitely require in most of your competitive exams. So I have done a part one to this video. If you haven't checked that out, please check it out. I'll link it in the I button or down in the description. And after you're done with that, come to this one. That is a part two for the same video. In this video also, I will be discussing 10 plus scientific phenomena that you should be knowing for your entrance examinations. So thank you so much guys for pouring out all the comments down below for me. And also for those who you, of you who requested this video, here I am with a part two to this one. If you want me to do some videos maybe on general chemistry or physics or certain reagents that are used, definitely leave it in the comments below. And if you want the notes to any of my previous videos, join the telegram link that will also be in the description down below. Now, without much further ado, let's get right into the video. So first phenomena that we have to discuss is why is the sky blue? So basically to answer this, one thing you need to understand that the color that you are observing is because of the phenomenon of scattering of light. Okay, when light is scattered, you have such phenomena that you observe. Now, in scattering, you need to first understand a very important phenomenon called as an important equation called as the Rayleigh scattering criteria. Now, what does Rayleigh scattering criteria or formula say? It says that the intensity of the scattered light is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength. What does that mean? That longer the wavelength, Okay, lesser will be the intensity of light. Now, this holds true only if, holds true, this condition can be applied only if the diameter of the particle scattering the light, so diameter of the particle scattering light is basically less than that of the wavelength of the incident light okay only then this holds true so according to this logic you can definitely say that the maximum scattering that you will observe maximum scattering you will observe will be basically for the shorter wavelengths okay shorter wavelengths will have the maximum scattering Okay, and which is the shorter wavelength? So we know that the longest lambda is for the red light and the shortest one is basically for the violet light. So light that is violet, indigo, blue and green will be basically scattered maximum. And who does the scattering in the sky? So it is basically done by the particles in the air, that is the molecules of air. So who does the scattering? Who does it? It is done by the molecules of air. What do the molecules of air scatter? It will scatter the light coming from the sun and they are selective. They are partial. Partial to whom? They will scatter those lights that have a shorter wavelength. Okay. And a shorter wavelength meaning more intensity will be observed. Now, you will say that if the longest wavelength is, okay, not scattered, fine. That's why we can't see it. But the longest wavelength is a violet. So why doesn't our sky appear violet? Now, the reason is that imagine this is the way, ray of light that is coming and this is the molecule. This molecule scatters the light. Okay, so it's scattering the violet light and it's scattering the indigo and scattering the blue. Now, what happens is during the travel, because violet is scattered the most, it goes on scattering, scattering, scattering. And by the time it reaches your eye, less of the violet light enters. Which light enters more? It's indigo and blue. Then you will ask me, why does the sky not look indigo? The reason is because our eye is less sensitive to indigo color. 
and therefore in total we observe the sky to be blue so the violet light is further scattered and doesn't reach our eyes really and therefore it's not the sky doesn't appear violet it doesn't appear indigo as well because our eyes are not sensitive enough to the color and what remains is blue due to which the sky looks blue to us now in case there is no atmosphere at all since if there is no molecule of air then what will the sky appear the sky would appear black okay so this is about your question that why the color of sky is blue then you may ask during sunset and sunrise why is the sky red now this is a good question the answer to this is that during sunrise and sunset the light from the sun okay the light from the sun has to travel a longer distance okay more travel has to be done because sun is at a farther location from the earth and therefore the light has to travel for a longer distance now what happens due to this long distance the shorter wavelengths okay shorter wavelengths are already scattered off they do, before reaching your eyes they are scattered off so the light that reaches after such a long distance is basically that which is having the longer wavelength which is your red orange light and therefore during sunrise and sunset you can ob observe this phenomenon okay then you will ask in the previous example that okay the sky looks blue why do the clouds specifically appear white in color now didn't i tell you about this condition in this condition i told you this particular logic is applicable only if the diameter of the particle scattering the light is greater than the wavelength of the incident light now what happens in case of the clouds in cases of the clouds the diameter of the particle scattering the light is less than that of the incident wavelength that is basically the size of particle is you know lesser than that of the wavelength and therefore this causes the diffusion of light there is diffusion instead of scattering hence the cloud they appear blue although the sky appears sorry the clouds appear white although the sky appears blue too okay so this is about why the sky appears blue and during sunrise and sunset why is it red so it has to do with scattering and the rayleigh's law of scattering next is something called as the aurora borealis okay now what is this aurora borealis borealis it is basically a natural phenomenon and where do you observe this natural phenomenon it is observed in the polar regions which are polar regions where you can observe it one is alaska and second one is the northern canada now what is this phenomenon actually basically you can see the light this light green in color and it appears to be dancing okay so a beautiful display of green light dancing is observed in the polar region called as aurora borealis and why is this so so basically this has to do with the magnetism of the earth okay so these are some things related the other thing that i would like to cover in this part is about the color of the ocean so why does the ocean appear blue basically and the reason is Uh, because of the scattering that we see by water molecules okay the same logic as we discussed above and even smoke you must have seen that the smoke coming off is slightly whitish gray and why is that so it is because of the scattering done by the minerals present in the smoke of the cigarette so that's about why things basically look the particular color okay now next you have to discuss about the weather forecasting using a barometer we must have all seen this simple device that is used to basically you know gauge the pressure so what is done is 
a entire tube is filled with mercury such that there is no bubbles so it is filled to the brim such that there is no bubbles of mercury present and what is done is it is directly inverted into a dish containing mercury okay now at normal atmospheric pressure what we observe is the amount of mercury in the tube is comes down to this much so initially you had filled it fully when you inverted and put it inside due to the decrease in pressure the liquid basically now comes to a halt at this particular point so the distance from here to here is called as the barometric height okay so barometric height and at a normal atmospheric pressure okay at our atmospheric pressure this height is somewhere around uh basically as you can see here 0.76 m of hg mm of hg okay so sort not mm sorry meter 7 0.76 meter of hg that is 760 millimeters of hg this is under normal condition now how can we use this knowledge to basically understand how to forecast a weather so to get that you need to understand that the atmospheric pressure is dependent on two factors one is the temperature and the second one is the water vapors in the air okay water vapors in air now the atmospheric pressure depends on temperature and water vapors okay and these two together basically what do they influence they influence the density of air okay so the density of air varies with the temperature and water vapor which in turn influence the atmospheric pressure let us understand how now the density okay the density of air decreases with the increase in temperature and an increase in the moisture so more the moisture higher the temperature lesser will be the density of air and less density of air means that the atmospheric pressure will definitely be less okay so now what you can say that if the condition like the air is moist or humid in that case what will happen to the density the density will definitely be so if it is moist this is going to be higher the density is lower and in case of dry air where there is a lack of moisture then in that case the density will be high okay so now we know this basic how does density temperature moisture and atmospheric pressure vary with each other so just remember this particular part that the density of air decreases with an increase in moisture and temperature and thus all of this the density if of air if it decreases that means it is going to decrease the atmospheric pressure and if it decreases the atmospheric pressure then you will have variations in this height of vacuum so let us see what variations now first condition okay if the height falls suddenly now this is the stagnant height that we can see so at sea level this much is 760 mm of hg is you, what you can see over here now if this mercury falls rapidly that is it falls down to here in you know fast what does that mean that means that the atmospheric pressure has suddenly decreased isn't it okay now the atmospheric pressure if it suddenly decreases what does that mean it means that the moisture content in the air and the temperature has rapidly increased and a rapid increase in the moisture of air is a signal of a storm or a cyclone coming so you can predict that by looking at this second if there is a gradual fall okay gradual fall means that the atmospheric pressure has slowly slowly began to decrease and that means that the moisture is increasing slowly which means that there is a possibility of rain okay and finally the third condition if it increases gradually okay if there is a gradual increase that means that the atmospheric pressure is slowly slowly increasing which means that there 
the weather is comparatively fair so it's a good weather condition okay so with this simple barometer you can definitely predict the weather hope this was clear thus far if you're liking the video don't forget to like it share it with your friends and do subscribe for similar content now next is if you have observed during winter days if the sky is filled with clouds you feel warmer okay so it is warmer when the sky is filled with clouds as compared to if the sky was clear okay now we will be understanding how does having clouds in the sky have anything to do with the nights being warmer okay now this is based on something called as the uh, wis displacement law now what does this say it says that if a body is heated it emits radiations of all wavelength it emits radiation of all wavelengths that is basically it tells you that the intensity of the light varies with the wavelength okay the intensity of radiation emitted now what is the mathematical expression it says that the lt is equal to a constant which is b that is the v's displacement constant okay now in short if you look at this expression what you can just say by looking at it is that the lambda the wavelength of the incident radiation is inversely proportional to the temperature so if at all there is a decrease in the temperature then there will be a emission of a higher wavelength so lower temperature means emission of a higher wavelength now how is this related to any of this let us understand step by step so first let us understand what happens during the day time so during the day time the heat from the sun okay is absorbed by whom it is absorbed by the earth now whenever a body absorbs a a body which is a good absorber is also a good emitter this is the kirchhoff's law so when sun, the light from the heat from the sun is comes to earth the earth absorbs it and during the night time since it is a good absorber it will even release the heat so the earth will release the heat back during the night time as well now the thing is that this is correct that the during the night time earth is going to radiate the heat but since the sun is hotter than the earth okay obviously it is like way hotter than the earth then according to this law what you can say is now sun is hotter okay that means that the temperature of the earth is lesser temperature of the earth less means what it is going to emit a longer wavelength so basically according to the law you can say that the earth will emit a longer wavelength than the incident light that you had from the sun and this is all because of the fact that lambda t should remain constant now since the the temperature of the sun is way higher than that of the earth it is basically going to always be that condition that the earth will have a lower temperature and if it wants to keep this lambda t as a constant if the temperature is lower the emission of wavelength should be longer then what was incident on it okay did you understand till here if you have understood this then we can talk about how the clouds play a role over here okay now clouds as well as glass both of this have a similar property that they allow radiation of shorter wavelength to pass okay so shorter wavelengths the clouds or glass they will allow it to pass through but the longer wavelengths they are reflected okay they are reflected now what does the earth emit it emits a longer wavelength and what does the cloud do to the longer wavelength it reflects it so if the sky is covered with clouds what happens is even though at night the earth is radiating heat off it will radiate the higher wavelength 
and what clouds do they reflect that higher wavelength so whatever is the basic um, wavelength that is coming the heat that is radiated by the earth is basically coming back to us and therefore if it is the sky is covered with clouds you will feel warmer whereas if it was a clearer day there will be no clouds and much of the heat would be radiated okay and this is the same principle that influences the greenhouse effect okay basically you have seen that plants are kept in a greenhouse now this greenhouse roof is made up of glass which works similar to that of the cloud so as i said they will allow the uh, shorter wavelengths to pass and the longer wavelengths will basically be reflected back now the wavelength that is incident is from the sun which is going to be the shorter wavelength and therefore it is going to pass now whatever wavelength is going to be reflected by these plants are obviously going to be the longer wavelength and therefore it will not be able to pass it will be trapped in this one which is actually a useful phenomenon because we want to to keep our plants cozy and nice okay so this is basically how the glass and this greenhouse work okay hopefully you have understood this part now talking about the deserts now in the desert it is always said that the days are extremely hot however the nights are also very cool now this has to do with the kirchhoff's law what does the kirchhoff law say it says that a good absorber okay a good absorber is a good emitter of what radiation okay so now your sand basically during the day time it acts like a good absorber and it absorb all the heat and therefore during the day it's very hot however with the virtue of this law sand at night should basically act as a very good emitter and this leads to more release of the heat and therefore it is less hot that is i can say it becomes cooler during the night time so that's on the on what basis this particular phenomenon is observed next you have something called as the fran hofer lines now you must have observed the spectrum of light many a time and can you see this there are some black lines around these lines are called as the fran hofer lines and we are going to discuss why is it so so basically you know that the sun emits white light okay now the light has to travel a long distance so the sun if you know has various layers right so the white light is emitted from here that you can say is the center which is called as the photosphere okay now light from the photosphere has to travel and it will reach the atmosphere of the sun okay the atmosphere of the sun which is called as the chromosphere now when the light is passing there is some particular molecules that are present the gas molecules are present here so these gas molecules that are present between the center to this layers of the sun would actually do what they will absorb certain radiation whatever is their favorite ones i can say they will absorb that right and according to kirchhoff law a absorber is a good emitter as well so what will it do it will emit certain radiation also and that emitted radiation of light is absorbed as these dark bands called as the fran hofer light so all these phenomenon that we discussed the fran hofer lines the desert days the greenhouse effect the the sky being warmer during winters in the presence of cloud is all based on the principles of absorption and emission and particularly in the laws given by kirchhoff and bees okay now moving on to a little different type of phenomenon or i'll say it's a particular modification that is done called as the davy's safety lamp so this is basically the lamp 
and the use of this lamp is it is actually used in coal mines okay now the thing about coal mines is that it contains a lot of methane in the air okay so there is a lot of methane now if you take an ordinary lamp inside the coal mine where you have a lot of methane what happens is the methane in the air the methane and the air will come in contact with the flame of the lamp okay and what would this lead to it would lead to an explosion okay so in order to prevent that davies you know he he basically made this lamp called the safety lamp the modification is that the safety lamp has this gauze around okay can you observe it's the gauze around the flame now what does this gauze do so this gauze is basically a metallic sheet and it conducts the flame okay to the entire surrounding so to, to the entire gauze so the flame is conducted equal uniformly around the gauze and the surrounding so basically it prevents from prevent any one point from being heated at a high temperature okay so any one point being heated at a high temperature basically it will prevent the the uh, surrounding from reaching the ignition temperature so if it doesn't reach the temperature for ignition there will be no explosion that is seen so it kind of helps to diffuse the you know the heat properly so that the methane doesn't you know catch fire and lead to an explosion so that's called as the tv safety lamp next up you have the simple phenomenon that you must have studied in school which we all know is bat using the sound waves to catch its prey so let us quickly revise how does this work so basically bats they secre they you know produce very high frequency pulses okay very high frequency sound waves and what they actually do is they detect the doppler shift okay doppler shift in the wavelength of the sound okay in the wavelength of the sound waves now if the insect insect i is far away from the bat okay so if it is flying very very fast and they are at a distance from each other what happens is whatever sound wave it is sending the reflected one okay has a lower frequency okay the frequency of the reflected sound wave is lower theek hai now when the bat and the fly okay and the insect are very close to each other the wavelength of the reflected sorry the frequency of the reflected light of the reflected sound increases and because of this increase in the frequency of sound waves that is coming back to the bat it understands the relative distance as well as the size of the particular prey so that is how bat uses this particular mechanism next phenomenon that you must have quite often observed during uh, natural disasters like namely while there is a huge storm that is blowing so during the storms what is observed is the rooftops of the houses are blown off so why is it that the rooftop blows off now this is based on the bernoulli's principle okay and let us try and understand how this thing works okay now basically the wind in this particular scenario is moving is flowing with a very high velocity now this high velocity decreases the pressure over the roof okay there is some pressure that is exerted by the atmosphere on the roof that particular pressure is decreased because of the high velocity now what happens is that the pressure that is below okay that is from here the pressure below it basically exceeds the pressure that was above so in initially when 
there was no wind that pressure was high and therefore nothing was to happen but now this reversion this causes the roof to be blown off so the roof is lifted because the pressure below becomes higher than the pressure above now again on bernoulli's principles work some works the vacuum brake now a vacuum brake is used in uh, basically trains for stopping the train in case of an emergency so for the emergency stop of a train you use a vacuum brake now how does the vacuum brake work okay now firstly steam okay steam at very high pressure is made to pass through a fine pipe okay can you see this pipe over here so basically steam is hot steam is made to pass from this pipe and basically this enters into the cylinder of the vacuum brake so this is the brake cylinder into which this particular uh, steam enters now this entering of the high pressure steam decreases the pressure inside the particular cylinder which causes the piston to be lifted okay and because of this the piston further is connected to a mechanical system that will cause lifting of the brake lifting of brake okay so trace the path the steam is sent through and the steam then you know is uh, reaching this cylinder which basically increases uh, decreases the pressure inside and this piston is lifted and this is for the connected to a mechanical system that us usually is connected to the brakes that lift them so this is how a vacuum brake works hopefully you have understood uh, this particular phenomenon and there are a few more which i will be continuing i'm sorry if the video goes you know beyond the normal time but i know that the exams are very close by and many of you wanted video on this so please stick to the end it will just take another 10 minutes okay now next one is the anomalies expansion of water very 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 important okay now let us first of all understand what anomalies behavior is observed now from 0 to 4 degree celsius in case of water you observe a abnormal behavior okay from the temperatures of 0 to 4 degree here what is the abnormal behavior it is that the volume in this case is inversely proportional to temperature so it is lower the temperature higher the volume that is more dense the water is okay what is the conventional thing so conventionally according to the charles law what is said that the volume is directly proportional to temperature so higher the volume higher the temperature more the volume but can you observe here the opposite is happening that as the temperature would increase the volume would decrease but this is only seen at the 4 0 to 4 degree range beyond the uh, 0 degree celsius basically the volume varies directly with the temperature okay so for the given amount of water if you increase the volume the temperature would also increase now this can be measured by using a dilatometer dilatometer can be used to measure this expansion if you want to know what other instruments also do and what are important with respect to the exam do check the description or the i button and go and watch the video after this one now this particular anomalous behavior is a very important one for the survival of sea animals especially in the cold conditions okay in the colder places or in the uh, temperature very low temperatures during winters this is essential for the survival of the sea animals okay now how does this have to do anything with that let us understand 
so firstly during winters what happens is there is a sudden drop in the temperature now what would this drop do this drop will lead to the cooling of the surface of the lakes so surface of lakes will cool to say 4 degree celsius now because there is cooling over here what would happen is definitely the water would become dense why because see if the temperature is decreasing then what will happen the vo volume also decreases and basically the part will become cool and it will become denser correct so increase in decrease in temperature means there will be a decrease in volume so there will be a basically an increase in density how because we know that density is equal to mass upon volume so if your volume is decreasing due to the decrease in temperature the density would increase so at during a cold winter time the surface of the water becomes more dense now because this upper layer is more denser than the lower ones what happens is this layer moves to the bottom it sinks to the bottom and what happens is the comparatively lighter fluid will come to the surface so lighter one comes to the surface okay now at this point when it becomes dense it will sink water which is present at the bottom okay its density being low will rise up now this water is again exposed to the atmosphere correct so now the water that is at the surface the lighter water that came up which is at the surface will also experience the lower temperature now once this water reaches say 4 degree celsius the volume would decrease okay and this will become less dense and finally it would freeze okay now once see the lighter layer it came on top na so now what happens again it is in contact with the light uh, with the uh, cool air now because of that because of the anomalous behavior what we observe is that this layer went down but now when the new layer came on top since the temperature went beyond your 4 degree celsius the ice was formed the liquid on the surface freeze now since the surface has freeze the inner water that sink that is still in the form of liquid itself so it helps this and sea animals to basically stay safe under the ice so even if the above layers have been freeze the lower layers still are in the water format okay so therefore it will you know uh, basically provide the warmth that these animals need to survive since we are discussing about uh, the anomalous behavior let in hand discuss about specific heat also you all must have heard that the specific heat for water is very very high as compared to a lot of other substances and therefore it is a very important uh, you know liquid that is used now let us understand what is the specific heat so by definition specific heat is basically the heat required okay it is the heat required to basically raise the temperature of unit mass of a substance by 1 degree okay so temperature heat required to raise temperature of a given mass of substance by 1 degree so the specific heat is maximum for hydrogen and it is minimum for are elements radon and actinium okay just remember this in case they ask it in the exam so these are the two that have the extreme and the lowest uh, basic uh, specific heat now let us understand what has the specific heat of water to do with this so the specific heat of water is very high what does this mean it means that you will require lots of heat or you would need to cool it a lot in order to even 
change the temperature by one degree Celsius. So you can say that water has a very high resistance to a change in temperature. So even to make a one degree Celsius change, you would require more amount of heat or a lot of cooling to do so. And hence, because of this property, water is basically used, you know, hot water is used in bottles and it, the cool water is used in, uh, you know, in cooling down the radiators, etc. So radiators, once they become hot, you need to cool them. So we use water because water wouldn't, you know, increase its temperature if you recirculate it for once around the radiator. If you use anyone that has a less uh, specific heat, then that substance will also get heated up faster. And therefore, we use water. So this anomalous behavior and the high specific heat of water basically makes it a very special molecule. So that's it from me for today. I hope you got to learn new things from this video and it was helpful to you. Do subscribe to my channel and keep sending me video recommendations. It's definitely a lot motivating for me. If you want notes, join the Telegram group. That's it from me to, for today. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.